We often picture the Arctic as a frozen wasteland, lifeless, unforgiving, impossible for man to survive. But the Inuit did more than survive. They built homes of snow, warmer than the wind outside. They lit lamps from seal oil, burning steady through weeks of darkness. They wore fur in layers inside and out, creating insulation that rivals modern synthetics. They used the snow itself as protection, pooled body heat like a living furnace, ventilated even in 70 degree phase blizzards when sealing tight meant death. They kept heat alive. They tamed the cold. No central heating, no electricity, no gas lines. And yet they engineered survival at temperatures that would kill most of us in hours. In this video, you'll uncover seven Inuit heating hacks, ancient methods that could keep your family alive when the power goes out and the blizzard rolls in. And by the end, only one question will remain. Were they the primitive ones, or are we with all our gadgets the ones unprepared for real cold? The Arctic may look like emptiness, but Inuit history tells another story. Archaeology at Thule sites shows structures built not of chance, but of design, snow-shaped to trap heat lamps carved to burn steadily on seal oil. Early explorers like Frobisher and later Rasmussen wrote of families surviving in spaces that felt engineered, not accidental. This shatters the old myth, an igloo was never just frozen water, inside temperatures held 20 to 40 degrees above the killing air outside. And when you place the Inuit alongside others, the Norse with longhouse hearths, Koreans with ondol floors, Slavs with brick pish ovens, you see a shared principle across cultures, capture heat control, it survived the night. So the story turns to their most iconic creation, the igloo, not a prison of ice, but a machine for holding heat. Most people think an igloo is freezing inside, just ice, just snow, a shelter that barely shields you from the wind. But archaeology and explorer journals tell a different story. According to finds at Thule sites, the Inuit shaped snow into compact domes that acted like insulation panels. The outer layers blocked the blizzard. The inner layer softened, then glazed into what ethnographers call ice glass ceiling warmth inside. In the winter of 1576, Martin Frobisher's men struggled to keep fire alive. Meanwhile, Inuit families endured the same storm. Their lamps burned steadily, their igloos holding warmth. As Knud Rasmussen later recorded in 1922, an igloo could remain 20 to 40 degrees warmer than the killing air outside. Imagine that, 70 degrees lives beyond the wall, yet inside, survivable. It was not primitive, it was physics. Snow is mostly air, 90% void, making it one of nature's best insulators. And the igloo was a machine to capture body heat concentrate it, and release it slowly through the night. Other cultures reached similar solutions. The Norse built longhouses heat pooled around the central hearth. Slavs raised the pitch, a brick oven that stored the day's fire. Different continents, same survival logic. Today, you can mimic the Inuit principle without snow. A tarp, a few cardboard boxes, a reflective mylar blanket, combine them, and you shrink the space you must heat. Smaller volume, higher temperature, twice as warm with the same effort. So ask yourself, were igloos just huts of ice? Or evidence that the Inuit understood thermal engineering centuries before the word existed? If the igloo was the chamber, then the lamp was its heart. The Inuit called it the kulik, a shallow stone vessel carved smooth, filled with seal or whale oil. Along the rim, a line of moss or arctic cotton served as wick. One matchless flame, steady, smokeless, and vital. Ethnographer Diamond Genis noted in 1923 that a single kulik could provide both light and heat through the endless polar night. And explorers compared its output to the warmth of a small stove between 100 and 150 watts. That was enough to dry clothing, warm food, and keep an igloo habitable at minus 70 outside. Archaeological finds at Thule sites 
show these lamps were central to daily life placed on platforms of bone or stone, sometimes carefully shielded from drafts. They were more than fire. They were culture. Around the Kulik, families gathered, stories were told, and survival was planned. Contrast this with the Norse who fed timber into open hearths or the Slavs who stoked brick furnaces. The Inuit had no wood to spare, no clay for massive stoves. They turned instead to fat, concentrated calories of the hunt energy stored from the sea itself. Today, the principle endures. A modern survivalist can use a biofuel lamp or even a controlled candle heater to echo what the Kulik achieved long, steady output with minimal fuel. Small flame, big endurance. So, the question lingers, was it just a lamp? or the most elegant survival technology of the frozen world. Most people believe that one thick coat is enough. Pile on the heaviest garment you own and you'll be safe from the cold. But the Inuit knew better. As recorded by Knud Rasmussen in 1922, they dressed in two layers of caribou or seal skin fur, turned inward on one layer, outward on the other. This wasn't fashion, it was physics. Air became trapped between fibers, between layers, multiplying insulation far beyond what one thick pelt could achieve. In the classical era before 1000 AD, these garments were simple hunting gear skins stitched with bone needles. By the time Norse traders reached Greenland, the layering had become a refined system, inner fur soft against the skin outer fur, catching wind and frost. When European explorers arrived in the 18th and 19th centuries, they were astonished to find Inuit hunters sleeping in snow camps without freezing protected not by bulk, but by strategy. Other cultures followed parallel paths. Slavs wrapped themselves in layered sheepskin cloaks. Norsemen wore wolf pelts over wool tunics. Different furs, different traditions, the same principle layers trap air, and air is the true insulator. Modern science confirms it. Studies show multiple thin layers outperform a single thick one, which is why today's survivalists follow the three-layer system base insulating shell. Light, flexible, breathable. So the myth breaks. Warmth is not about piling on weight. It's about trapping stillness. The Inuit understood that long before synthetic fleece or Gore-Tex. And the question remains, was this primitive clothing or evidence of cold climate engineering disguised as fur? 90% of snow is air and air when trapped is insulation. The Inuit learned to use this truth not in theory, but in practice. Archaeological finds at Thule sites show snow storage pits carved into drifts where food and tools stayed at stable temperatures. Ethnographer Diamond Genis observed in 1923 that Inuit families built snow walls around their camps, barriers that did more than block the wind. They created pockets of trapped warmth. Picture the scene, a hunter kneeling in silence, stacking blocks of snow, not to defend against enemies, but against the Arctic itself. Outside, the mercury sank to 70 degrees. Inside the circle, warmth lingered enough to survive. European expeditions confirm this. In 1881, members of the Lady Franklin Bay expedition discovered that exposed tents were lethal, while snow shelters raised interior temperatures dramatically from fatal sub-zero to tolerable. It wasn't superstition, it was engineering. Other civilizations echoed the same principle. Norse settlers banked earth against wooden walls. Slavs buried cellars under soil and straw. Koreans built thick clay walls to buffer against frost. Different landscapes, same logic insulation, by mass, by still air. Today, the lesson is simple. No snow. Use cardboard. Use leaves. Use a wool blanket stretched over reflective mylar. The tools change. The principle remains. Trap air, slow its movement, and a small space becomes twice as warm. So snow in Inuit hands was never just frozen water, it was survival material, a weapon against winter, carved from the storm itself. Imagine five hunters huddled together inside a snow shelter, each body giving off nearly 100 watts of heat, the same as a small light bulb. Alone, one person could barely fight the Arctic. Together, they created a furnace of flesh and breath. 
Archaeological evidence from Thule sites shows sleeping platforms wide enough for families, not individuals. Ethnographers like Diamond Genis noted in 1923 that Inuit families often shared close quarters children pressed between parents conserving warmth. This wasn't desperation. It was design. European explorers soon realized the difference. In 1576, Martin Frobisher's men froze in separate tents, while Inuit groups nearby endured the storm. The math was simple. Five people meant 500 watts of steady heat inside an igloo already insulated by snow. Other cultures knew this too. Norse families gathered around the hearth. Russian peasants often slept above the brick patch, whole households together on its warm surface. Survival was never solitary, it was communal. Today, survivalists can replicate the principle. A sleeping pod of blankets, a family tent within a tent children, nestled between adults. Smaller volume, greater warmth, twice the endurance. So body heat, often dismissed as weak, became the Inuit's most reliable resource. The question lingers, was this mere huddling? or a calculated science of warmth written into family life. To survive the Arctic, you sometimes had to do the opposite of logic. Imagine this, you carve a hole in the roof of your shelter, not to lose heat, but to stay alive. The Inuit always kept a vent in the igloo. Ethnographers recorded that without it, the air quickly filled with smoke, moisture, and carbon dioxide. Warmth alone could kill you. A vent was life. Archaeological finds at Thule sites show igloos shaped with small apex openings angled away from the prevailing wind. Knud Rasmussen, writing in 1922, explained how families left a fist-sized gap above the dome. It carried away steam, keeping the interior dry. A dry igloo was warmer than a wet one. Moisture froze clothes, collapsed walls, and suffocated sleep. Ventilation prevented disaster. Other cultures discovered the same paradox. Vikings cut smoke holes in their longhouses. Slavs built chimneys into their brick patch. Koreans vented their ondol flues to keep rooms breathable. Across the world, the lesson echoed, fire without air is death. Today, the principle holds. When burning candles or oil lamps in a blackout, leave a crack in the window. Just an inch. Enough for safety, enough to keep the heat you need. So ventilation was not weakness. It was wisdom. The paradox remains you must let the cold in just enough to keep death out. Picture an Inuit hunter moving across the ice, never still for long. Each step, each swing of the harpoon, each push of the sled. It wasn't only survival work. It was heat. The human body produces energy like a furnace at rest about 100 watts. In motion carrying loads or cutting snow, the output can rise to 400 watts or more. The Inuit understood this rhythm work to generate warmth, rest before sweat froze. Ethnographers recorded how families rotated tasks, one hunting another, building another tending lamps, so no one overheated and no one froze. Archaeological finds at Thule sites include snow knives and sled traces tools designed for constant use. Movement was life. Stillness was death. Other cultures shared this logic. Russian peasants worked fields in winter to stir the blood. The Norse split logs in rhythm, not just for fuel, but to keep warm themselves. Even the Slavic banya sauna steaming bodies in midwinter was a way to generate heat and dry clothing before the cold set in again. Today, the principle applies in every blackout. Don't sit in stillness until the chill bites. Move. Rotate tasks among family members. Generate heat with muscle before reaching for fuel. So the Inuit taught a paradoxical truth. Warmth isn't only stored, it is made through motion. The question remains in our world of buttons and switches. Have we forgotten how to heat ourselves with our own hands? Seven hacks, seven lessons from a people who faced 70 degrees with no electricity, no central heating, no modern gear, yet endured. The igloo, a machine of snow. The kulik, a lamp of oil. Layers of fur trapping air. Snow walls that insulated. Families pooling heat. Vents that saved lives, work that generated warmth. Each was not guesswork, but engineering tested by centuries, refined by survival.
And here we are, surrounded by thermostats and circuits, yet vulnerable when the power fails for a single night. The Inuit remind us that survival is not about gadgets. It is about principles, insulation, airflow, shared heat motion, tools change, logic endures. So perhaps the real fragility lies not in the past, but in us. They engineered survival from nothing. We struggle with everything.